The other day, I was listening to an interview with Esther Perel, who's the relationship counselor of the moment. She's a Belgian psychotherapist who hosts a podcast called Where Should We Begin?, where she counsels anonymous couples on their relationship issues. And it's thrillingly voyeuristic because you get to listen in on her clients discussing all their marital problems. In the interview I was listening to on the podcast This American Life, Esther was discussing the ways in which lockdown conditions are affecting relationships. And she said something I found really interesting. We have never slowed down like this. Never on a global level have we slowed down like this. It's a long time that we have only been accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. And for the first time, and I don't think we have begun even to understand what this is going to do to you, to have had to really, you know, experience what that kind of a slowdown will do. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but Esther is right. The COVID-19 pandemic has enforced this great global slowdown. There's a mass economic slowdown, of course, but that's only one aspect of it. Pretty much everything has slowed down. Nobody can travel. Plans of all kinds are on hold. People who are used to rushing frantically about from school drop-offs to business meetings to gym are mostly confined to the four walls of their homes. And if you've tried to get any kind of administrative chore done recently, like replacing a bank card, you'll know that very few things are happening with any kind of speed. And in South Africa, I think one of the things that's causing frustration with the move from level five lockdown to level four is that it feels like things should be speeding up again, and yet they're really not. So many of us are used to living at a hectic pace that there's something about this great slowdown that feels deeply anxiety-inducing, not just from a financial perspective, but on a psychological level too. As Astaire said, We've been accelerating for so long that we've forgotten what it feels like to hit the brakes for this length of time. So this week, we thought we'd use this moment to explore the benefits of taking it nice and slow. Welcome to Don't Shoot the Messenger, the Daily Maverick podcast where we bring you the stories behind the stories. On today's episode, we're investigating the virtues of slowness, learning about the secret talents of the world's slowest mammal, Exploring the delights of the slow food movement and hearing how the annual month of Ramadan brings a moment of pause and contemplation to Muslim lives. I'm Rebecca Davis. win in a race between a tortoise and a sloth? The tortoise. The sloth would stop and have a nap halfway, probably. <laughs> they can move quickly for about three seconds and then they need to stop and have a rest. <laughs> I'm talking to Dr. Rebecca Cliff, who describes herself as a sloth scientist. That term just sounds like someone in a lab coat who's really lazy, in the same way that I might describe myself as a sloth journalist. But in Rebecca's case, it's a statement of fact. She spends her days studying the world's slowest land mammals, the sloths. Can you paint us a bit of a word picture about where you are right now? Yeah, I'm sat in my office in the Costa Rican rainforest. Um, It's an outdoor office, which is pretty nice, but I'm surrounded by nature, which also includes mosquitoes, um, but also hummingbirds and butterflies. And there's some howler monkeys in the trees just over there. I'm hoping they don't start howling because they're going to destroy this interview. It's a pretty nice office, I'm not going to lie. Becky says people are often envious of her job because in recent years, sloths have had a bit of a makeover in the public imagination. Now loads of people think sloths are adorable and cuddly and want to hug them, which is a sloth's worst nightmare because all sloths want is to be left the hell alone. It's not like I run around cuddling cute baby sloths all day. I just spend a lot of time in the forest staring upwards at what might be a coconut or it might be a bird's nest, but it could be a sloth. I have actually stared at what I thought was a sloth for over six hours and it turned out to be a bird nest. Sloths might be considered cute and Instagrammable in some quarters these days, but that absolutely was not the case until relatively recently. In fact, sloths have been consistently maligned as the idiots of the animal kingdom. 
The poor sloths, when they were first discovered, they were actually described in the scientific literature as the lowest form of existence. So they didn't get off to a very good start. And I think it's because early explorers found this animal that appeared to just be sleeping all day and, and doing nothing. And it has algae growing in its fur, so they looked like they were moldy. And they just got this reputation as being dirty, smelly, lazy, and stupid. All of those very negative things. And it sort of stuck with them for a very long time. So even today, a lot of people actually think of sloths as being a little bit ridiculous and definitely the laziest animal on the planet. In some areas, this goes a little bit further and they're seen as the devil's animal because sloth is actually one of the seven deadly sins. So they were named after a deadly sin. And so everybody thinks that they're just lazy. There's just, there's nothing good about them. Becky says sloths actually don't sleep that much, only about 10 hours a day, which is considerably less than me on an average weekend. But the reason people think they're sleeping all the time and the reason why Becky could once spend six hours staring at a bird's nest she mistook for a sloth is because they are indeed very, very slow. So sloths are extraordinarily slow. Average speed is about one kilometer an hour, which doesn't seem that slow. But it's not that they just move from A to B slowly. It's that everything is slow. It's a bit like they're swimming through a lake of Nutella. So they can't turn their head fast. They even blink slowly. Everything is in slow motion and it's fantastic. <laughs> okay, but why are sloths so slow? I mean, surely it must serve some kind of evolutionary purpose or they would have died out ages ago. Well, it took scientists a long time to figure this one out because what is the point in being so slow? The most common question I get asked is, how are sloths even alive? Like they live in the jungle where everything wants to eat you. How are they alive? Well, their slowness is how they're alive. They've actually outsmarted everyone for a very, very long time. Because predators, these are th animals like jaguars and harpy eagles. So big predators who all find their prey by seeing it move. They're what's called a visual hunter. If you take a sloth and you put him at the top of a tree and he moves so slowly, he just blends in perfectly with the background and the predators never know where they are. So they're just sneaking around, um, avoiding sort of all the normal stresses of life that all the other species go through. They're just taking it easy and it's worked for about 64 million years, which is amazing. So it turns out that being incredibly slow is a brilliant survival strategy in the jungle because everyone else is sprinting around eating or being eaten, and sloths are literally just chilling, too blessed to be stressed. Being so slow is literally what keeps them alive and out of trouble. Becky told me that sloths live almost their whole lives alone. In fact, there's really only one context in a sloth's life where they experience any kind of social drama. And that, as Esther Perel could probably have predicted, is when they come together to mate. Then two male sloths sometimes fight over a female by trying to push each other out of a tree, which is a really successful strategy because once the loser gets shoved to the ground, it takes him hours to climb the tree again. Becky says there's a lot about sloths' lifestyles that actually seems extremely appealing. The more I've got to know them, the more I can just relate to them, really. <laughs> I, I, I've, I have a saying that to overcome the sloth, you must become the sloth. So I spend a lot of time just watching sloths, which is a very relaxing thing to do. It seems to me that sloths are basically the ultimate spirit animal for humans in lockdown at the moment. I think everyone all over the world is sort of starting to take a leaf out the sloths book at this moment in time, because we're being forced into firstly isolation, because sloths are the original social distances. They really just want to be left alone. So we're all being forced into isolation and we're being told that we can save the world by just sitting on our sofa, basically. So I think just to slow down and take time to just just live life moment by moment um, and not stress about it. And I suppose also, from what you've said, sloths effectively stay alive by not moving very much, which is exactly what our governments are telling us to do, right? 
Exactly. So yeah, sloths only move really when necessary. They spend a lot of time just resting and digesting. And yeah, we're all now being told that we should just stay at home and stay on the sofa. And I think that is the ultimate sloth life really, isn't it? I think there's a lot we can take from the sloths at this point in time. When we're back, the renewed popularity of an approach to food which turns its back on the culture of instant gratification. We love making this podcast, and ideally we'd like to keep making it until podcasts are replaced by a new kind of technology. But to do so, we really need your help. We ask you to leave reviews on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, not simply to boost our egos, though we love that too, but because reviews and ratings make it easier for other people to find us. Thanks again for your support. The topic of food has assumed enormous importance during the current lockdown in a number of ways. By far the most important is the lack of food, the fact that millions of South Africans are going hungry. And on Daily Maverick, we've been running a series of articles devoted to that incredibly urgent social problem. But for those who are lucky enough to have enough food, it also seems that cooking and baking have become one of the major activities that people are turning to to get through lockdown. If aliens from another planet were to scan our social media currently, they might assume we were a civilization who subsisted entirely on banana bread. Food is comfort. Preparing food can be something pleasant and relaxing to do, unless you're as bad a cook as me. So it's totally logical that so many of us seem to be taken to the kitchen for hours on end at the moment. But it's also a moment where a culinary philosophy which was born in Italy in the 1980s is enjoying a new relevance. We have always given importance to food and we have been working for the last 30 years to try to improve the food system. And also in this period of crisis, many of our values, our ideas, our principles, they can be central to face the crisis. The importance and the necessity to change the economic model, the relevance of local economies and the fact that we need to put local economies at the center of all our activities. It's time for generosity, friendship, solidarity, not for competition. That charming Italian accent belongs to Paolo Di Croce, the Secretary General of the Slow Food Movement, which is the approach to food which is having a particular renaissance at the moment during lockdown, when people can no longer fulfill their cravings for instantly available ready-cooked meals as easily as they used to. Somebody who knows a thing or two about food is Tony Jackman, former restaurateur and recipe book author and the editor of Daily Maverick's weekly Thank God It's Food newsletter. Here's Tony explaining the origins of the slow food movement. The movement started in a town in northern Italy called Barra, B-R-A, Barra, in 1986, but it started very small in 1986. But in 1989, it started to take off in the greater world. And its mission was to prevent the disappearance of regional traditions, good food, gastronomic pleasure, and the slow pace of life. So the slow food movement started as a direct response to the proliferation of fast food joints and chain restaurant franchises, which can make you a hot meal in a matter of minutes, but it's food prepared robotically by an army of underpaid burger flippers. Food without heart or soul, in other words. And also food which pays scant attention to local cuisine or traditional cooking methods, which the pioneers of the slow food movement feared might be lost forever. The slow food movement's a counterpoint to the massive popularity of fast food. In a nutshell, it really is as simple as that. Traditional cooking, cooking what's near you, cooking what's produced sustainably and near you, cooking good and clean and fresh like the old soap suds ad, I won't say which try that was. In fact, good, clean and fair rather than fresh are the bywords of the slow food movement. Good, clean, fair. A good quality, clean as in free of bad things like insecticides and herbicides, and fair as in produced by people who need to make a humble living from what they grow or produce. And that, that to me, especially right now with this lockdown period and what it's teaching, I hope all of us, certainly a lot of us, is to try to be more humble. And if ever there was a moment for people to adopt the principles of the slow food movement, it would be right now, where going to the supermarket feels like navigating a particularly stressful video game, and much of what you'd normally buy isn't available. Tony says it's a chance to rediscover traditional local food staples and cooking techniques. So, for instance, where Tony lives, in the Karoo, 
preserving fruit has been a way of life for centuries. In the Karoo, obviously, in almost every part of the Karoo, you know, where fruit is grown, fruit preserves are made. And, you know, if you look at a jar of preserved figs, for example, or preserved makatan, which is a wild watermelon, similar to watermelon, really. But, uh, makatan is the preserved rind of a wild watermelon. If you look at those jars of those things at your farm shop or the one that you bought that's now somewhere in the cupboard or in the back corner of the lower shelf of the fridge, that is two things. A jar of preserved fruit is two things. It is the fruit that is preserved and it is the syrup in which it is preserved. And you can take that preserve and you can use it to add a little bit of depth and breadth to all sorts of sauces or you can use it to make a sorbet. And what I've been thinking about during this lockdown, as most people have, is that we are looking now at either what we can grow or what is in fact growing in our garden or perhaps our neighbour's garden. Now, despite its name, the slow food movement isn't necessarily about cooking food slowly, though that is one of the aspects that Tony says can offer rich rewards. If you combine food with time, it can only get better and better. I cook things for hours and hours and hours. Something that tastes pretty great after two hours, after three hours tastes quite extraordinary, after five hours is fit for a king. Not that I think you have to be a king to deserve that. I mean, time in that sense is an ingredient of food. If you're up for throwing yourself into literal slow cooking as a kind of meditative practice, Tony says one of the dishes which requires hours to bring to perfection is a French onion soup. French onion soup is a thing that takes a lot of time. It's probably the, the most time-consuming soup that there is, certainly that I know of. Because if you want to make a really, really fine French onion soup that is in, intensely flavoured, you need to roast your whole onions in their skins for five hours before you start making your soup. Time to get back to basics and start roasting those onions. From a slow food movement to a no food movement, this lockdown now coincides with the holy month of Ramadan, where millions of Muslims worldwide are fasting from dawn to dusk. And what the restrictions of Ramadan amount to are a resetting of the clock for that month and adapting to a new pace of life. It sets a new discipline into our lives. There's a time for starting the fast, there's an onset of the fast, and there's a time to break the fast. So that timing differences plans our days in a very real way and in a very different way. Prior to this, you would include your menus and your meals as a matter of course. Now, those things doesn't exist. And you only have the starting of fast and the breaking meals. And that sets a particular discipline, a new discipline. That's Fatima Nuddin, a Cape Town-based Islamic educator. Fatima explains that the purpose of Ramadan is not simply about depriving yourself of food. It's a deliberate slowing down of the speed of modern life and erasing all the meaningless trivialities of your daily existence to allow space for deep reflection and introspection. Self-discovery happens when you go quiet and we reflect. We cut out all the mundane activities of seeing to our basic needs. You know, things that we normally do, we now start questioning, why is it important? What is it bringing? How am I supposed to gain with this particular thing? Am I adding to social justice? Am I not acting in a socially just manner if I act in a particular way? What are my actions and what are the purposes of my actions? And what are the causes and the impact of my actions are being looked at much, much more detail during this time. It also presents us with many aha moments when we start understanding, when we start reflecting and thinking and looking at smaller things. We get to connect the dots between things, see a bigger picture that we never ever contemplated before or that we were keeping away from ourselves in our busy, busy lives. Fatima says that many Muslims come out of Ramadan, that month of slowing down and simplifying life, feeling deeply refreshed energized by a new sense of what really matters 
and a new ability to recognize the good in fellow humans. And perhaps the same will be true for many more of us after this great global slowdown, when life inevitably starts speeding up once again. The music for this episode was composed and performed by Mohammed Daoji from his soon-to-be-released EP, Otherness. For more on the album, check out the link in our show notes. Don't Shoot the Messenger is a podcast brought to you by The Daily Maverick. This episode was produced by Haji Mohammed Daoji with sound engineering, editing and support by Bernard Kotzer, Tevya Turok-Shapiro and Catherine Kotzer. You can listen to Don't Shoot the Messenger on The Daily Maverick's website, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more, subscribe to The Daily Maverick's newsletters and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Nobody mentioned roast chicken gate.